In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious Father, thank you once again for the opportunity to gather around your word. Open our hearts and minds tonight to help us learn when we are in anguish and when we are uh, assaulted on all sides, seemingly from satanic attack and the attacks of the world. Show us how to find comfort in your law and in all of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Okay, I'm going to read Psalm 119, 81 to... Did you not bring a Bible? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to read Psalm 119, uh, verse 81 to 96. That'll be the next two sections. See, I could read them to you in German, but I'll spare you that. Because I'm reading Luther's 1545, because I, I just I like how his translation turns out. Okay, this is Robert Alter's translation, Psalm 119, beginning in verse 81. What's Psalm? 119. My being longs for your rescue, for your word I hope. My eyes pine for your utterance, saying, when will you console me? Though I was like a skin flask in smoke, your statutes I did not forget. How many are the days of your servant? When will you exact justice from my pursuers? The arrogant have dug pitfalls for me, which are not according to your teaching. All your commands are trustworthy. For no reason they pursued me. Help me. They nearly put an end to me on earth, yet I forsook not your decrees. As befits your kindness, give me life that may, I may observe your mouth's precept. Forever, O Lord, your word stands high in the heavens. For all generations, your faithfulness. You made the earth firm, and it stood. By your laws, they stand this day for our, all... Let's try that again. By your laws, they stand this day for all are your servants. Had not your teaching been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Never shall I forget your decrees, for through them you gave me life. I am yours, O rescue me, for your decrees I have sought. Me did the wicked hope to destroy, I gained insight from your precepts. For each finite thing I saw an end, but your command is exceedingly broad. And that's where we'll wind up tonight. Now, are you reading something about 119? Yes. Mm -hmm. Verse 81. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. I don't know what you're. It's not like it in the, in the Bible. Hmm? It's not the same as in the Bible. No, it's not. I'm reading a different translation than you're reading. Oh, I didn't know where you were. Sorry about that. What, is that the Reformation? Or is that the. Which Bible is that that you're reading? It's NIV, isn't it? Oh. Online? International? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's probably going to be quite a di bit different from that one. Yeah, like just in verse 81, I mean, NASB has, My soul languishes for your salvation. I wait for your word. And Alter's translation is, My being longs for your rescue, for your word I hope. That's quite a different uh, translation. But I like it because uh, the way Alter translates his Hebrew, being a Hebrew scholar, um, he, like I said before, he kind of allows the poetry to come out in the English a little bit more uh, because the original is poetry, uh, but not poetry like we're used to, you know, where things rhyme, uh, for instance. None of that happens in the Psalms, but it just has a little more picturesque language, I think. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, my life longs for. I hope on your word. My my, my soul longs for. Yeah, it's pretty close. Anyway. Um, So 
So this section of the psalm we're going to be reading, these next two sections, it's going to be about you know, when we are in anguish, when we're being tormented, which the psalm before this has been about that too, but in particular in this section, uh, it shows us when we're in anguish, when we're longing for God's comfort, how do we get that comfort? And it gets delivered to us in the word. And so this part of the psalm is kind of a reminder of, okay, he's asking that question. Okay, when are you going to help me out? Uh, what is he seeking to get that answer from God? Excuse me. Ooh. Ooh. Terrible heartburn, sorry. <clears throat> Ugh, that's better. Um, you know, like when, when we're looking for help from God, it'll be like, Lord, please help me get out of this, whatever it is I did. Or, uh, you know, God, help me with this. I don't know how much more I can take. That's probably our more modern way of saying it. It's like, okay, Lord, I don't know how much of this I can take. I need help. Or, you know, if you get me out of this one, you know, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, a little more devout than that, probably. But that's really, that's what our, our prayer is sometimes. It's okay, I'm in trouble. I'm turning the only one that can give me an answer or help because I've exhausted all the possibilities down here on earth. Uh, in fact, they're the ones that are out to get me. So three times in this same uh, section, he is talking about, and I'm using cheat notes on this because I don't read Hebrew. Uh, he uses this Hebrew word kala three times to talk about um, how he is afflicted and how he is crying out to God. So verse 81, his soul languishes. Uh, Old King James would have been faints, my heart faints. Uh, then 82, my eyes fail with longing, or my eyes fail. And yeah, what does Luther have? Uh, my Nogans in and kind of more talking. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, my eyes, my eyes do not see, is literally what Luther says. And then they had almost consumed me upon the earth in verse 87. So basically talking about, okay, fainting, failing, being destroyed. This is big action verbs describing the world's effect on the writer, on the psalmist, which again, I think is David, but we don't know that. Uh, and this, this verb means literally worn out, like, like a worn out shirt, right? Worn out threadbare. Uh, so it's exhaustion, physically, emotionally, mentally exhausted. Uh, and that is what he's trying to explain. Yep, go ahead. Uh, I don't think the Lord always gets you out of a tough situation or something that really happens. I, I think he, he might give you strength to get through it. Mm -hmm. But I have found that you know, you, sometimes you just got to plow through it and have time go on. I mean, he doesn't, mm -hmm. th there's no zapping, you know. Right. So it, it's kind of like... Uh, you know, in the olden times, right, in Bible times, they had prophets to tell them what God was thinking, right? And then, then the prophet would deliver what God has to say. Uh, or before that, they had Moses, prophets, who they didn't listen to. Uh, you know, and then they wanted kings, judges, the whole nine yards. Uh, but in all those ways, very seldom did God actually speak to them one-to-one, -one, right? Other than like Moses, whoever was the high priest that year, they got to go into the Holy of Holies. Other than that, they didn't really interact with God uh, sort of on the mountaintop, but not really. They weren't right up close and personal with him. So God always went through an in intermediary, which is no different than today. You know, how, how does God answer our prayers today? He does it through our neighbors. So even though, yeah, God doesn't personally come out and go, okay, I'm going to fix this for you. Here are my hands. You can see I'm doing this. He's going to arrange for those that you come into contact with to, to be of help. That's probably why some, the unbeliever, you know, if you say to them, well, let's pray to the Lord will help you. Well, you know, they're gonna say, oh yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. yeah. And, you know, and, yeah, and, and any conversion story you really read um, where someone says, oh yeah, you know, I prayed with somebody and then I realized, you know, God was working through this person or that person. And then you go, okay, they got it. You know, they understood, yeah, God doesn't answer necessarily direct. You're not going to have the lightning bolt from above, probably. I mean, nothing stops him from doing that today, but 
you know, that, you know, uh, what was our verse from last week? Was it last week? No, it's from Sermon Sunday. It was uh, from Hebrews, right? Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, uh, I think. We look that up. <laughs> That's kind of an important one for tonight. So Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, which again, I get, here we go. I think it's Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Was it, you know, in many and various ways, right? How's it go? Ugh, sticky pages, come on. Yeah. You know, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in, in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he, whom he also made the world. So Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Uh, so now he speaks to us through his son. But Jesus isn't here, so the way he speaks to us through his son is through his word, which Jesus is the word incarnate. So now we have Christ's words. That's the answer to all our prayers. The answer to all our questions is basically, this is how he speaks to us. Uh, or he uses you to help someone else who doesn't know how to seek stuff out in the scriptures or even know that you can do that. He uses us to be the solution to someone else's problem. Right? That's a fair assessment, wouldn't you say? You know, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't give you a whammy from heaven all of a sudden, but he does give us people in our lives to uh, do what his will is, basically. All right, so it's interesting in this one, you know, because he's talking about being physically emotionally, mentally, spiritually exhausted. It's not just because of what this verb, this verb uh, kala means. Uh, so it's not just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired and worn out. It's like I'm mentally and physically drained, right? So it's not I'm spiritually feeling weak or I'm physically feeling weak. It's just like the total package. It's his entire being is just slammed. And they're saying, hey, I'm... I'm I'm done, I'm out, I'm broken, everything's wearing out. Uh, my enemies have almost used me up. And then verse 82 uh, says, right? Uh, my eyes fail with longing for your word. That the verb is, what, what other verb do we have? What, are you reading ESV, M? Yes. What's the verb in 82, is it fail? Long. My oh, eyes long for your promise. Okay, my eyes long for your Okay. Yeah, MESB has got my eyes fail with longing. Uh, with longing, is that what you guys got? All right, so he's not completely destitute of the word yet, but he feels as though it's getting close. You know, they almost consumed me. So whatever he's experiencing, it's not just a crisis of faith. It's not just a crisis of the body. It's a crisis of the total person. Uh, it's pretty bad. So what was I going to say? Okay, so under that, that weight of persecution, he's going to show us, the psalmist is going to show us how he... How he survives? How does he use? Uh, how does he use God's word to get him out of the jam he's in? So he's crying out in anguish under this heavy burden. He waited till he couldn't take anymore, which is interesting. Uh, he's endured. He's endured all he can. Now he can't take it anymore. So now his suffering is affecting him so deeply. He's beginning to feel like I'm never going to be the same if I don't get out of this. And he's going to continue believing that the Lord will do everything that he's promised. Everything in this psalm up to this point is, I delight in your promises, I delight in your statutes, I delight in your law. All of this stuff is good. And now he's taking that same advice that he's giving himself. It's like, okay, I've got to, I've got to cling to the word because when that's, nothing else is left, that's what's left. And then his eyes are failing. It's kind of neat. A turn of speech. What does Alter say? Yeah, my eyes pine for your utterance. That's kind of a lot different than 
My eyes fail with longing, so my eyes are longing for. Um, he has a given note for that one, though. That, that's an interesting way he uh, translated that. So my, my eyes pine. When you're pining away for, some, for somebody, you miss them, right? It's like, oh, I miss my, you know, my fella. You know, he went off to war, and I'm missing him, so I'm pining after him. It's that same kind of word that they would use there. Uh, so he's pining for the word of the Lord. It's like he knows, that, okay, I'm pining away for this because I know that's what I need. That's what I want. Uh, which is a neat way of saying it. I don't know if we've ever said, you know, I'm really pining away for the word because I know that's what's going to help me. We might not say it that way, but we kind of mean it that way. All right, so he's been... Another way of looking at it, too, is he has looked for so long for the word to be fulfilled that his eyes have begun to fail. It's like, I've been, I've been searching, I've been longing so long for this to see relief, to see mercy, and now my eyes are even failing from being able to do this anymore. Uh, yeah, so... Again, up to this point, we saw that the psalmist was relying on the word, right? He was relying on the word to be his relief. And this time, I mean, I get that, we get that sense again, but he's really questioning it, questioning it a little bit more than before. So, you know, he acknowledged previously that the word had the solutions, that the word was where the promises were delivered. But now, he's, his eyes are wearing out because... The only thing, maybe the word's not going to be enough. You know, he can't wait anymore. He wants God to do something. And I guess we have to see what is God going to do? What is he going to say that God has done for him? So his eyes have failed. He's asking, when will you comfort me? Uh, He is, you know, having a little bit of a crisis of faith as well. So it's not just physical and mental, it's spiritual as well. He's like, oh, okay, the word's been enough up until now, but now... You know, I'm still looking here for your promise. I'm looking in these words and I'm not finding it. And now he continues, continues his prayer. When will you comfort me? So he compares it to a, a bottle or a wineskin uh, in the smoke. And of course, it's one of those wonderful figures of speech. We don't know exactly what it means. So it's like, oh, that would be really helpful if we knew what that meant. Um, Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, with, with actual bags made of skin, after you fill them up, the weight eventually will open up the stitches because it is an animal skin. It's not a, a sewn cloth or anything. So if you, if you rawhide stitch a bunch of animal skins together, and it's watertight when you test it, and now you just start pouring stuff in and let it hang there, mm-hmm. it's eventually going to stretch, and it's going to loosen up those, those stitches. Uh, And then you would use, you know, use new wineskins. Uh, the old wineskins would be put in the fire and burned up because they're no good for putting new wine in because they're just, just going to leak out. Uh, so it's like that, uh, what parable of Jesus is that? I should have looked that one up. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. It's like Luke, I think, but off the top of my head, I can't remember. I want to say it's Luke. Luke. Anybody got an idea? Because I I don't remember where it is. Matthew 917. Let's try that. Matthew 9. Matthew 917. That's it. Uh, it was talking about fasting. And he says, uh, nor do people let's see, no one puts a patch of unshrunk, unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. 
but they put new wine into fresh wine skins and both are preserved. Okay, so, and yeah, that's what they would, they would take the old ones and they would burn them up to use that to help stretch and cure, kind of cure the new wine skins. Uh, and then they would shrink from the, in the heat, they would shrink even as they were getting stretched from what you were putting in them. Uh, wow, three, the three synoptic um, books, gospels. gospels have the same thing in them. Mm -hmm. Each one has a, don't, you know. Well, how many other ways could you write it, I guess? I guess, but it's just, it's interesting. Doesn't John have it too? No. No, oh, I thought John did too. All right. Well, anyway, that, we keeping you awake? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's probably the best way to interpret this. Um, become like a wine spin in, skin in the smoke from lack of any other kind of context. Because again, this could be one of those Hebrew turns of phrase that we're not sure what it means. Uh, but if we're using scripture to interpret scripture, and I only know the one other place they talk about wineskins, it's probably a pretty good bet that that's what they're talking about. Uh, She's got a question. Sure. What? So it's like a saying of their times, like how maybe like far in the future they might hear like a saying of like a training cats and dogs and not understand it. Like right, exactly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because we don't know what it means because nobody makes wineskins anymore, right? I mean, maybe there's some like weird person that's into arcane crafts. There's a couple of those guys in every hobby, so I'm sure somewhere somebody makes those. Uh, but yeah, for general use, we don't know what that means anymore. Uh, it's kind of like also like if salt has lost its saltiness, what good is it? And we're like, how does salt lose its saltiness? I mean, you can dissolve it and then you evaporate the liquid and it's still salt. So how does it get not salty? Because the stuff that they mined for salt back in the day had a lot of other impurities in it, uh, which were, okay, you had to eat dirt anyway sometimes. So there would be dirt or, or other minerals in with the salt and you'd put it on your food and you'd wind up eating these other minerals. Uh, but then if you had a bag with the salt in it and it got wet, the salt would dissolve in the rain, come through and wind up in the ground and all would be left in the bag after you got it wet is the stuff that ain't salt anymore, the rest of the stuff the salt was connected to. So in modern terms, we would never, probably wouldn't talk about that. We would never say, well, you know, if your salt has lost its saltiness, you're like, what are you talking about? Salt never loses its saltiness, but back then it did because it wasn't all salt. So that's a, the best, one of the best examples, I think, of something that's in the Bible we would never say anymore, but we get it. This one, we don't get it. Well, wine skins were basically just leather. Yeah. Leather. That mm -hmm. They're purposing for the right. package. Right. right. And if it was in smoke, it would just get hardened instead of being pliable anymore. So it didn't break. Right. So, and one of the things, hanging it over a fire, though, once it has the wine in it, it would start to uh, would dry the skin, mm -hmm. but dry it with the liquid in it, and it would shrink in the stretched state, I guess would be to say it. Because yeah. if you just make the bag and put it in there, it's going to stretch because it's... Sometimes they use skin, sometimes I think they use bladders too. Uh, sometimes they made them even with a lining, which was a little advanced, but they did. Uh, but yeah, that's, so that's the whole idea behind that. Okay, so anyway, but the whole idea about being like the wine skin in the smoke is he feels all shriveled up and, and used up right? The next, the best thing to do with that shriveled wine skin in the fire is to add it to the fire that doesn't serve any other purpose. So he, that's how he's feeling. That's what he's feeling like. Feeling like that all, everything that's happened to him, all this affliction, his suffering, it's all together now useless. It's like he, they're ready to, I'm ready to throw myself away, basically. And Yeah, and then he asks, you know, how many, how many are the days of your servants? It's like, how much longer do I have to put up with this? I mean, is this going to be it? And, and then when will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? That's another familiar uh, thing for the psalmist to be writing. Well, before we go too much further, thinking about 
the very freeing thing that the psalmist recognizes that he has that maybe we don't all the time is that you know we have the freedom to dump everything at God's feet you know whenever we want for whatever it is we need to say uh, it's not something we would not be so ready to do say to um, you know one of our neighbors and it's like you're going to wear out your welcome with that neighbor if all you do is come by and complain all the time but we all have a friend like that that I, you're the one that they're happy to come to and complain because you know you're not going to judge them even though someone else could come with the same thing and you would judge them because you like this person more you're closer to that person and I think we all have that at some point in our life there's some person who comes to you when they've had they're absolutely at a trough right they're at the lowest point they're going to call you because for whatever reason you help lift them up out of it and maybe while it's happening we don't really care for that role but uh, and then how much more do you think God does that when we dump stuff at his footsteps? It's right? like, oh, here, God, I got, I got nothing. Here's everything exactly how I feel about it. I'm not mincing words. Is that easier, do you think, because God is in heaven and there's a disconnect between our prayer and the, what well, I don't want to call it the real world, but the material world? Do you think it's easier to do that if you, had, if you were told you have to go make confession did anybody here was ever Catholic? No? Good. Because I'm going to pick on them for a minute. She was a coward. She was. So, if the only way to get out of, of some type of hardship is what it was the church told you, you have to go confess to the priest. And, you know, God will hear you through him and then do what he says. How much less willing would we be to be? Because even though he's a priest, even though everything you tell him is confidential... Are you going to be as ready to confess to him as you would to God when you're alone in your room at night praying? Or were you going to, are you going to change exactly how you're going to say it? Because even though it's going from in his ears to God's ears, are you really going to be that open to do that, to speak to another person like that? It depends, I guess, if you're used to it. But, I don't think so. But no, because it's a whole lot different when it's somebody else sitting across the room from you. Right. You might hit on it a little. Yeah, but it, you might not lay it as yeah. plain. Right. Right? right. You know, at least not until you... And, and because that's, on, that's weird for us as Lutherans, even even though individual confession has never gone away, it's still a thing. You just have to ask to do it. But 99, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of Lutherans have never done private confession. So to us, that would be really weird. It's like, okay, yeah, I know... I know he's listening with God's ears, but I'm still, he might think, what is he going to think of me if I tell him this? You know, they don't get that disconnect where it goes in my head and it disappears after that. It's not in my brain because it never sat there. Uh, so I just, I think it's interesting to think about that, that you have the opportunity and it can be very powerful to have your confession and the absolution and someone touch you on the head and say, you know, in the stead by the command by Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. That's a whole lot more personal than just praying, you know, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. You know, so there it's on the other side of it, it's more physical, more in the moment, more real. And that's cool. We probably like that part, right? Because absolution is awesome. But the confession part, you're still going to, oh, do I really want to lay it all out there? Or just enough so he knows what I'm talking about. I would think that would be diff really difficult for most people to do nowadays. Yeah. I, have, I have an old Hungarian, <laughs> old Hungarian friend, an older fellow, mm -hmm. and he said that he could get out of going to confession. He and his wife were both good Catholics. Mm -hmm. He said his way of getting out of going to confession was he ate a lot of garlic and she wouldn't let him go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> garlic is good. <laughs> Um, what were you going to say? And the priest is probably talking. Huh? The priest is probably talking. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're really close with like the pastor, you're more likely to do it. You're right. Comfortable. Right. Yeah. So it's. I mean, and I'll just speak from personal experience. The very first time I ever did it, it was weird. I mean, it was really weird. Like, this is weird. I don't know. I have no other words for it other than this is completely foreign to anything I've ever done before. But you know, they say. This is a thing you can do, so let's try it. And it's like, okay, this is kind of awesome, actually. 
But, I think if we were brought up that way, yeah. you know, as a little child, and, you know, you wouldn't just not think about it that way. Yeah, and that's very emotional. Oh, it is. Like once you is. do it, like mm -hmm. I, I don't want, like I would probably cry. <laughs> no, well, I mean, did I tell you guys the story about individual confession at the seminary? How they do that? No. Uh, for uh, they do a thing called corporate confession at the seminary no. the night before we have the Lord's Supper in a service. So here's how that works. It's actually in our hymnal. But instead of everybody goes to their individual pastor and confesses your sins, we all sit together and we go through like the confession that's at the beginning of our service, except a little bit more detail. So basically we go through all 10 commandments. And it's like, okay, these are the 10 commandments and you're supposed to be thinking, what did I do? And then like, okay, we get through all that and we all agree, okay, we hear about the words of institution. We know why we're gonna to go to the Lord's Supper. We know what we need to have forgiven. And then we stop. And then everybody gets up and actually goes to the communion rail. They line up, it's a big chapel, so they line up on both sides of this thing. So there's like 50 guys maybe. And the pastor goes around one at a time, puts his hand on you and goes, in the stead of by the command by the Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Down, doom, 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 down, each single one. And by the time you get to that one, you learn if you're going to do this, I want to be over there. <laughs> so you get me first, and then I can kind of tune these guys out because you can hear the hitch in their voices. You can just tell, it's like, okay, like if you listen real carefully, you can hear the tears hitting the floor because it is really emotional. And then to do that with that many guys, it's like, oh, wait, it's real quiet because as soon as you're done and you're dismissed, that's it. You, you leave. Nobody ever says a word until you're out and like within like probably a building away from the chapel, someone might dare to actually speak because you're all, you're stuck in your head at that point. She's like, that was really cool. And I hope I don't have to talk to anybody because I'm going to start crying. It's, it's powerfully moving and doing it individually, one-on-one -on -one, is just as powerful, if not more powerful. But again, it's weird because we don't teach it. And you start teaching it to the confirmation age kids. Well, it's going to be a generation before it catches up because they're going to have kids of their own and blah, blah, blah. It's going to take that long to bring this back. And they've been trying to bring it back for at least 15, 20 years now to be back in common practice, but it'll be well. Was there any differential between the different pastors that were doing that service? Now, you know, some pastors have very, I'm going to use the word vindictive, it's probably wrong. But, mm -hmm. I mean, a forceful voice and then other pastors have timid voice. Yeah, like some of them have like a gentle voice. Feelings? Yeah. Um, actually, I, it's kind of funny you mentioned that because there's a couple guys you're like, oh, I bet this guy's just going to be hellfire and brimstone. And, we talk, and he's like, holy cow, that was the most gentle thing I ever heard that guy say. He's just like that in the classroom. Then you got these other guys that are like, oh, he's real meek and mild. And he got, gets up there to forgive you all your sins. By God, you know your sins are forgiven because he told you that. I mean, he's blah, blah. You're like, I've never heard him talk that loud before. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it's all over the map. It really is. When I was in convent school, <laughs> the, uh, we confession every Saturday. Mm -hmm. And we were in a pew, and you know, does someone go, confession goes here, the pew, you go, when you get done, you walk around and come on in, and that's when it slides down and goes. Well, I had done something that, I, not earth but anyway, I really had, I got out of place with a nun. And uh, I wasn't, she made me so angry, and I said something really I should not have said, and I had not got over my anger. But I got over confession Saturday, so <laughs> I'm sliding down, pew, my turn. So the first thing you say is, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. First word you spit out. Well, I said a bunch of stuff, I don't even remember. But I didn't say what I, I did not confess that I had really got out of order. Not with anyone, but just a nun, because actually what I did was I told her to go to hell. <laughs> now, that was not, and when okay. you're in a convent, you mean that that place, you know, I, it was not a, a curse thing. That's just how angry she had made me. And not that I did not mind, but nonetheless. <laughs> but I didn't confess that. A bunch of other stuff, but not that. <laughs> Got my absolution, came out, walked around, got down into the pew till everybody's done. And as the others were going down, you have to keep sliding down to get, well, they thought we were done, and guess who was on the end of the pew? Oh. Again. 
<laughs> and it kept bugging me because I hadn't confessed this. And so, and I knew it. So I, I did. I got up, went to confessional, and said, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I heard, <laughs> you know, I was trying not to <laughs> And I did confess. But I, of all the confessions I made, that was the one, and, and I, he laughed. And, and I think he kind of peaked. He said he was one, even though he knew it was probably me. <laughs> it, just to say the words, my last confession was 10 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the best scenes in the Luther movie. He gets done doing confession and he goes, Martin, you know, I've listened to your confession for two years now and you've not once confessed anything interesting. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. Yeah, so, so he's laying it out there, uh, letting everything, just kind of everything hang out in front of God. So we are able to pour our souls out to the God. We can leave ourselves bare at his feet. You know, he's not going to tell anybody, right? Because you're talking to God who's in heaven. Who's, he's everywhere. But when, when, it's, when it's a spirit you're talking to, it's probably easier for us than it is to sit right across from somebody and go, well, you know what I did? And to, I think the faith we have that that person's not going to repeat what you just told them is hard. But yeah. I think it's easier to confess whatever you did to something. Let's say I did something to you and that wasn't very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can go home and rattle off these prayers and, and I can be very sad about that I did that and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. That's easier to do than going back to that individual sure. and ask. Mm -hmm. Or and tell them I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. And, you know, will you, will you forgive me? Yeah, and that is... And that's a very hard thing to do sometimes, but you're not going to be, um, have a peace of mind until you do that. Especially because it's like, out loud. Like, it's one thing, because when you, like, think in your head when you're praying, it's like kind of half thoughts where it's like, you think it and then you like kind of almost skip over it, but like when you're saying it out loud, it brings up other things and then it just mm -hmm. like, it's completely all out there where like if you were just doing it in your head, you kind of like skim over anything that's like tough to even just like think about. So it's a lot more difficult, but more lifting, I would think, because it's like, okay, I really got everything out there this time. Right. I, you know, and it's a good friend, you know, you'll learn, or probably already even know, you know, you'll learn that you'll have a good friend who actually will draw all that other stuff out of you because they know you. So you're like, okay, let's see if I can get, it's like, that doesn't sound like you, so just keep, they'll lead the conversation around so you wind up telling them the whole story, not what you wanted to tell them. And they're really good at extracting that from you. Because they're, yeah, because you're that friend, or you're that friend for somebody, you just know somebody, okay, I know they're not telling me the whole truth, so we're just going to talk and talk until eventually they'll fess it all up, and then they'll be like, oh, yeah, you're right, because we lie to ourselves. Oh, yeah. But we're like, very, very good at it. I'm not a person, I didn't do that. Yeah. No, are the priests um, more, like, open like that, and they'll ask you questions, and... I think it depends on the priest. It's all on you. No, I think it depends on the priest um, and how much time he's got for you. I mean, if it's one of those, okay, like, I don't know if it's like Sunday morning before a church, confessions aren't going to be very long. But yeah, it depends, I think, just on the, it depends on the man. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I could say I've, I've done individual confession for a handful of people in the past, like, almost two years now. So it doesn't come up that often. Mm -hmm. But like certain... People, I know it'll take some digging to get to the, it's like, this is not, why are you asking for forgiveness for this? It's not really sin. Let's keep, mm -hmm. keep yeah. going and you draw it out. And then, okay, eventually we get there. Mm -hmm. And it just goes like that every time. Mm -hmm. And then other people are just like, hey, I did this. Boom. And they're like, okay. <laughs> they, they don't have any of those reservations. It's like, I know I screwed up. I should not have done this. And, but those are the people that are more open to, what you would have called penance, right? Mm -hmm. So you had to do your act of penance. Well, we don't have to do that because 
we don't do that. We consider that a work that's unnecessary. But to, to go to the person you sinned against is certainly commanded by God where you're supposed to seek that person's forgiveness. And like you said, that's the thing we don't like doing. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, yeah, I know you kind of did this to me and, or, and I sinned against you because of this and I really don't want to look you in the eye and fess up to it because, and nine times out of 10, that other person's like going, what are you talking about? I don't even remember that, right? <laughs> but it's been bothering your conscience so bad. Yeah, so it absolutely depends on the, the person giving the confession and the person hearing it. Uh, and yeah, they don't really teach you how to do that. <laughs> It's like, because it? it's like pulling teeth, trying to get, it's like, so, so what can you do? It's like, you do whatever, whatever works. And it's like, okay, well, how do you convince people that this is good? Because you just keep talking about it all the time until people start doing it. Because uh, if you require it, you know, that's the problem with the Lutherans is ever coming up with something saying, I, you have to do this. And they'll be like, since when? I've never heard of this before. Yeah. Then, then you just, you've got a problem. So, Yeah. So anyway, God expects us to cast our problems at him. Um, and if you look at, um, you don't have to turn to it, but Hebrews 4.16, I was, you should really do the book of Hebrews 4.16. Let's see. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, so what we have to do is we have to know, okay, enough's enough, go confess. And actually you need to read, we have to go back a couple more verses, talk about, talking about Jesus. If you look at, uh, for the word of God is this, we should all go all the way back to 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin." Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So seeing Christ as our great high priest, as the the father confessor, if you want to use that terminology, right? Because he's been there along with us, except he did it without sin. So Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. Jesus knows what it's like to... uh, Basically, every temptation that we ever face, you know, he knows what that's like. But he was able to face them without sin. And now he can hear and he can understand, okay, I understand how humans do this because you are broken and fallen and that's what you do. Uh, so there's, I mean, you're not going to shock God, I guess is the point I'm trying to make, is you're not going to shock God with your confession, are you? He already knows we did it. Right. He already knows you did it. He already knows you're going to confess it. But Yeah. And then I wait for the soul, uh, wait for the Lord, my soul waits in his word, I hope. Uh, Psalm 130, verse 5, that came up in our morning prayer a couple days ago. Maybe it was yesterday. Uh, so I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word, I hope. So I'm waiting for the Lord to come again. But in the meantime, I have his word, and that's upon what I hang my hope is on the word, because it's what he's given us. And then you look for our example. We look at the psalmist. Okay, we look at Paul. I mean, if anybody ever deserved, you know, punishment, it, right? We would think it would have been Paul before his conversion. And then you look at all the persecution he put up with after, and you're like, if anybody's going to break, maybe it's going to be this guy. But he does. He joyfully goes through all this persecution, uh, which you have to realize has an, that's an incredible amount of faith, you know, knowing that he's been forgiven for all the horrible stuff he was doing. And then God chose him for this calling and his life has been miserable since the first day. And it doesn't bother him. I mean, it bothers him, but he knows exactly where to take it. He takes it to God, takes it to God. And he's just like taking it until Rome finally caught up with him like the second or third time. Uh, so it's just amazing to see 
Okay, Paul shows you exactly what you're supposed to do in these circumstances. Yeah. And then, and then you know, then he repeats also that you know God's promises are true, so He can't lie. He can't not fulfill His promises. And, you know, Paul reminds us of that. The psalmist reminds us of that. In fact, there's is there one in this section? Because there's there's going to be uh, I know all your commandments are sure. Yep. Eighty six. Yep. All your commandments are faithful. They have persecuted me with a lie. Help me. Right? The arrogant have dug pits for me, men who are not in accord with your law. All your commandments are faithful. Right? So he's not only... He's, well, let's talk about that section because that's kind of interesting. So, the psalmist is... I'm just going to start calling him David. Okay? I know it's... We don't know if it's David, but I'm pretty sure it's David. Uh, hmm? Where are you going in the psalm? Uh, verse 84. Verse 84. Yep. Right, so now he starts questioning God. And that's usually what we do too in the grand scheme of things, right? So we're looking for, he's looking for the word while he says, when will you comfort me? So I'm, I'm looking to your word and I'm asking God, when will you comfort me? Even though I become like this wineskin, I don't forget your statutes. So no. when are you going so to help me? How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgments on those who persecute me? Um. So now he is asking for judgment on those who are hurting him. But before we get to that, it says he asked God, well, how much longer do I have to put up with this, basically? It's like, okay, here's these guys. This is what they're doing. How much longer do I have to put up with this? You know, so he's starting to question God. And it's like, ooh, should we be doing that? Should we be asking God, when are you going to answer? Uh, so how long is this going to be like? When, are, when am I going to have some justice? So that's 80, verse 84. All right, so he's drawing God's attention to those who have contempt for the psalmist. Uh, and he calls them, what does he call them? Yeah, he calls them arrogant in verse 85. You know, so he calls them the arrogant, or what else do they use? Uh, insolent. Insolent, okay. And then what does Alter use? Yeah, just the arrogant. Yeah, when we execute judgment on those who persecute me, the arrogant have dug pits for me, and then uh, men who are not in accord with your law. Uh, and then Alter just has the arrogant have dug pits fall. Try it again. The arrogant have dug pits fall. One more time. The arrogant have dug pitfalls for me, which are not according to your teaching. It's a little bit different than what we have in Eng our English translations, but I kind of like that. You know, so pitfall. A pitfall is is not a pit. A pitfall is a thing that looks like you can walk on it. And then as soon as you step on it, you're like a wily coyote with a sign going, help, down you go. All right, so it's a trap, right? The arrogant have dug these traps for me, which is not what you teach. So, but all your commands are trustworthy. For no reason they're pursuing me, help me. You know, they nearly put an end to me on earth, yet I forsook not your decrees. So he's like banking on God to see, look how good I am. Look how I haven't given up the faith. So this is going to have a little twist at some point. It has to. So he's look at what the bad people have done, but look at the good, what I've done. I've kept all your, all your statutes, all your things. It's going to be okay. Stop doing that. And he looks to be revived by God's uh, patient love. So it was probably too big a piece to take at one time. So let's go back to, to all of a sudden questioning God. Uh, 
should we be doing that? Should we be questioning what God does? Yep. Good, good. that is the right answer. Why? I, I, I think at times you can even get mad at him. <laughs> you can argue with him. Yeah. And you can demand things of him because he promised. Um, now, if you get too rowdy, <laughs> yeah, you good. know, then you might have to slip in a prayer of asking for forgiveness. <laughs> but, you know, I good. think you, you, you have to do what you have to do. No, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so can you, can you question God's judgment? Sure. Mm -hmm. You question him until you're blue in the face. Sometimes you might even give him an answer why. You know, but most of the time it's just going to be okay. Get this out of your system, and what is he waiting here? But you know, not my will, but yours be done, right? Because in the end, that's what always is going to be. Uh, so yeah, we question God's like, hey, is this going to end? You know, we're still we're still fighting this virus. It's really screwing up the country. How, when is this going to be over? And if you notice, we've stopped praying about it every Sunday. It's like, okay, when, when did that happen? We maybe need to get it back in there that praying for this pandemic to go away. But even that's become the new, okay, so this is what happens. And that's what happened in ancient times, right? They would start to abandon God's law little by little, and all of a sudden you have these nations that are completely devoid of God. And where did they come from? Well, it didn't happen overnight. You know, they just slowly start turning away. But the psalmist is talking about him not turning away, but pay attention to his enemies because they have... Uh, a lot of people think it's a sin to question God, and it's not. Um, Didn't Jesus question God? I'm sure he did. We'll put it this way. Every question that's asked in the Psalms, Jesus said, because this, all the Psalms are about him. Um, and again, tradition holds that he prayed all 150 Psalms from the cross. So, yeah, not, not my will, but yours. Let this cup pass from me. I mean, he asked about that, and he didn't get the answer he wanted at that time. He got the answer that he needed, right? Did, did that cup did not pass, but he sent the angels to bolster his strength for what was to come. And then sometimes you, he doesn't answer you until oh, 50 years later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, and sometimes, you know, if, if we don't feel like we've gotten an answer because we asked the wrong question because he answers every prayer. So if you're, if you're getting no answer, maybe you didn't ask the right question. There's always my ways are not your ways. My yeah. thoughts are not my ways are higher than your ways. Exactly. And this side of, side of eternity, we do all the things we may not know. But one thing I have found my peace in questioning God is that it reminds me that there of, of the moral code that's inside of me mm -hmm. that if I you know if it was not there which he put there I didn't do that but you know if I didn't question it it would be like he was not a part of my life he was not a part of my being and not right. part of my character so to question him it's it, it's a good thing to me you know oh, it just yeah. and uh, this is as you read this you kind of go back to uh, the other you know verses that we've read and how this begins to accelerate mm -hmm. as far, you know it's just I've been good I know it I've been good I was real good I was really 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 good you know yeah. and these people are still at me or this mm -hmm. thing is still at me you know and, and so the question is a two way part of a two way conversation we think the conversation with God is just you say something and, he, and, and shut up mm -hmm. but questions are a wonderful way to have conversation with God if nothing else sometimes it brings it back to our remembrance what we already know Right. You know, it'll bring back scripture verses or, you know, times when in fact it was either worse or just as bad and he stepped in. So, it, you know, questioning God is a great, to me, it's a good thing. Yeah, and a lot of time I think us talking to God is actually, I mean, he's listening and he answers, but sometimes that's how we work out stuff ourselves. Exactly. And it's like, okay, I'm talking to God and all of a sudden God gives you a little bit of recall of what his word actually says about that and you go, oh yeah. And then, okay, well, I, I'm good now. Yeah, I've been yeah. down this road before heaven. I go, God, yeah. yeah, yeah. What did I teach you? Remember? So, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm not supposed to do that. Sometimes I blame God for what I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because oh, that's you know, sometimes too. I'll say, you know, yeah, you're holy. You're up there. You're not going to, you know, I'm just this, this little person down here who's full of sin. 
this is the way I am, and so what do you expect? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. You, you can't. Oh yeah. Now look at. Uh, I'm. You can look it up if you want, but I'm looking at James chapter one because I'm on a James kick this week, but I think it fits. Uh, so it starts in James 1, verse uh, 2, let's say. So consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let the endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask it of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like the flowering grass, he will pass away. And stop there, because it goes on like that. But... You know, what James is saying is, okay, good. All these bad things and trials and stuff that happen to you, that's good. That's a good thing for you. And because the testing of your faith produces endurance. And we see that in our lives, right? We have things that test us. The psalmist has things that are testing him. And he's kind of jumping to the punchline a little bit saying, okay, I'm being pers persecuted. I would like you, God, to take care of these guys sooner rather than later, but I have not abandoned you in the meantime. It's like in the meantime, yeah, I still know I'm a sinner, but, which he doesn't come right out and say, but basically, you know, if, if you take delight in the law, you must take delight in the fact that the law shows your, you your sin and your need for a savior. Uh, even back in the psalmist time, because they knew they were sinners, and they were saved by the promise of the one to come. So, yeah. And then, you know, God gives us that wisdom that we want, you know, just like he gave to Solomon, he wanted a double portion, but <laughs> God will give wisdom to everyone who seeks it, but the two questions we love to ask are how long, and when, and he doesn't answer those necessarily. They often go unanswered. You know, so apart from God's word, there's no answer to the seeming indifference of God to the suffering of his saints, uh, this one writer uh, wrote. There's no answer to his mysterious silences. His people pour out their hearts in impassioned and persistent pleas, but God remains silent. When this is the case, we have to trust God and rest in the assurance that he loves us and does all things well which he does, but like Isaiah 64, will you, 64, 12, will you refrain uh, these, from these things, O Lord? Will you hold your peace and afflict us uh, every way? You know, kind of saying that, well, it's God that's delivering this stuff, uh, but it's not. Uh, and James, what we just read in James 1. Yeah, and then Psalm 6, verse 3, my soul is sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? You know, that's that question. We don't, just don't get answered sometimes. Okay, and then 86 to 88, we're wind up spending the whole time in this first section, but that's fine. So, verses 86 to 88. Uh... Okay, all your commandments are faithful. They've persecuted me with a lie, help me. They almost destroyed me on earth, but as for me, I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. So in this section, he's still asking for the Lord's help. You know, so we've got uh, like kind of five points or four points that they're, he's making here. So we go, we know... We trust God's word because we know it's trustworthy. You know, so that's what the psalmist is saying in 86. All your commandments are faithful. Uh, we go to God with this situation because we're being wrongfully persecuted. Uh, so he's, he is maintaining his innocence before God. You know, his oppressors are oppressing him. Uh, but none of the stuff he's being accused of has any validity. And he's kind of explaining to God, which is weird explaining to God that like he's the good guy in this particular instance. Uh, God already knows that, right? 
You know, so why has he got to kind of fuss up and go, hey, you know, I'm being steadfast over here while these guys are picking on me. Uh, it kind of sounds a little weird. Why, why does he got to tell God that? God knows that, right? But then because he feels like he's in a life or death situation, right? Yeah. Um, you know, it says that they've almost claimed his life. He's not exaggerating. He's not necessarily exaggerating like we would be. It's like, oh, you know, all these stupid people picketing the church today, they're killing me. You know, because they're holding up signs out there, right? You know, they're killing me. We don't really mean that the people holding the signs are like physically hurting us. But the psalmist saying, you know, that they're, they're after my life, he literally means these people are trying to kill him. And so and even in all that pressure, he's still... Trying to be faithful to the Lord, trying to be faithful. Okay, but he trusts it. He trusts God's word. And because it was a matter of life and death, so this persecution he's he's enduring, he's appealing for God's help because of his own faithfulness. That's the appeal he makes to God. Um, which isn't necessarily the way you should do it, right? But because he's keeps on repeating, you know, I'm still faithful, I'm still faithful. Uh, but he does know that God's love is uh, sufficient. And that, uh, what was I going to say? You know, and then he's kind of making a deal. You know, if you make, if you preserve my life, I will continue following your law. Um, Again, every time the psalmist says that, we have to read between the lines. That he's, he's doing his best to keep the law and he's repenting when he doesn't. That's kind of how we have to read that. But no matter, the big takeaway from this section is no matter what, God's love is sufficient. Um, even when death is near, we still know that his love is sufficient. Whatever his plan is, is going to be for his ultimate good. Uh, you know, like in the 23rd Psalm, right? And yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, you know, I fear no evil because thou art with me. Uh, how does anybody remember that in the ESV? It sounds weird. You just automatically go King James, King James. on the 23rd Psalm. So, you know, so even though, I, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not afraid even of dying because I know God's with me. So I already know, oh, there was somebody else that went before me like that. That was Christ. You know, he died, he rose. He's been through that too. And he's the one that's going to carry us through it, you know. And we know that because the Word taught us that. So we're not even we're not alone even in death. So in this persecution that the psalmist is having, he's fine. He's got it. It's like, Lord, I wish you'd take these guys away, but I know you are enough, no matter what happen, whatever happens. No. Uh, Yeah, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. Hebrews 13, 6. We should really do Hebrews. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, you know, be not far from me, O Lord, my strength. Uh, hasten to help me. Psalm 22, 19. Questions? Comments? Because we kind of just did that first section, which is fine. There's more to each one of these sections than it seems like when you start talking about it, you know? It's like, okay, an hour just went by pretty easily. You realize I can hear every word you say. <laughs> I said. I heard you. <laughs> I said, you keep talking, that's why it goes longer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I just, it's funny when I edit the recordings, it's like, okay, it should have been over about here. And it's like, why is it still good? It's like, and I listen, then I start listening. And he goes, okay, we can stop there for this week. And then I talk for like 12 more minutes. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm the reason it goes long. That was pretty funny. Well, we can take it's supposed to take an hour? Yeah, but we always usually start around 7.15. So. Yeah, yeah, so we're, we're good. Yeah. Some people are waiting. Wait, it's time. been an hour. Yeah, so we'll stop there. But you know where we're going to skip to? I'm going to tell you this right now because one of my favorite parts of this psalm, which is probably one of your favorite parts of this psalm, we're going to skip the next two sections. And we'll pick it up in verse 105 next week because your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path is one of my favorite verses. Yeah, that's Psalm 119, verse 105. Uh, so that's where we're going to start next time.
by the way, that nun did not receive her final vows. No? <laughs> I'm not saying that as a mean thing. I'm just saying that, you know, she didn't, I mean, that was, but, but did she really get it, I guess? Yeah. You were keeping tabs. I, I was sorry for her, but she was really, really nice nun, but, you know, but anyway, for whatever their, by their guidelines, she did not. Do they make you cut your hair? When you for, when you become a postulant or whatever, they still do that. Uh, yeah, they still cut. Yeah. Hmm. Neat. Do they get any repercussion with the ruler? Why don't they don't do that? Shave their head. Repercussion out. from the nun. What with the ruler? Yeah. Well, because like in medieval times, <laughs> if a, if someone cut a woman's hair in public, that was a huge insult. That's like ripping all her clothes oh, off in public. Really? Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So like just cutting it in the room, but like going bald. And yeah, because because they follow that that thing in the Old Testament that says basically says you know like a woman's the virtue is in her hair or something where it's like the longer her hair is the more virtuous she's she is because she's spent all this time growing her hair. And so if you just walk up and it takes years to get your hair that long, so if you just walk up next to her and go and cut her, it's a huge insult. It's right. still or it was a, pu a punishment like someone in the lower classes. It's also a way to get smacked. Yeah, probably. Not the new costumes. Oh, well, you keep their hair. Yeah, they keep their hair. Wait, they, the Bible doesn't cut their hair. It's separate. Right. They don't have because it's their vanity. You know, so, oh, the hair, well, see the, yeah, see the Proverbs say that, like, that a woman's hair is her vanity because every woman was proud of her long hair. They cut their hair real short. I don't know. Well, see, like lower, if, if a lower class woman got convicted of a crime, she might be executed. But if an aristocrat got convicted of a crime, they might just cut her hair in public and not harm her physically. And everybody's like, yeah, they're okay with that because it was such a big shame thing. Don't ask me. I don't get it either. So if, even if someone just like having their hair short, people would always be like, why? Yeah, if a woman liked her hair short, they wondered what was wrong with her. Probably. But anyway. All right, so we'll stop there. We'll pick up 108 next week. And nobody has any questions or comments. We will close together with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.